you know what, this is something that keeps cropping back up whenever I'm talking to people. Um, you know, take a look at this, or why don't you do things this way? And uh, I thought it'd be valuable to uh, spend some time on, uh, on, on this, uh, because life can be a lot easier. Um, so let's get things right, start off on the right foot. Uh, this is very applicable to me in any case. Uh, <laughs> So I'm, I, you know, I've been with DNN since 2003, and uh, I'm, I'm a commercial module developer. I, I basically work on one uh, module uh, that is commercial, document management module, since 2004, um, and I'm invo involved in a host of, uh, of open source modules, notably the the blog module of uh, of late. And uh, in various various uh, uh, community efforts in DNN, uh, for years I've um, I've worked in localization and internationalization of the platform, and just wanted to say that therefore it doesn't mean I have an answer to everything or that whatever I consider best practice is necessarily what you should be doing. Um, it's just that I have an opinion, and that opinion comes from this basically. So for me, the module development process, the process, what does it look like? Well, first we have a phase where we are um, setting up our project. Um, you know, we have an idea, you got a, a request or an idea in our head, we want to make a module out of that, um, want to cre start creating that module. Setting up, coding, building, testing, the kind of that's, that seems to be this kind of a perpetual engine that's inside of it as we're going trundling along and packaging and what happens after packaging well it just kind of goes out into the wild um, in case of a, uh, an open source module and a commercial module that I do um, it's not for one single customer but for a whole host of people and uh, then sometimes you know it will come back and uh, you know, get some feedback from the wilderness like hey you know this doesn't work or hey how about that feature and we go back into this uh, into this cycle so <clears throat> when I talk about automation um, I'm thinking specifically about automation of uh, setting up coding testing and packaging um, and yeah, exactly. The building itself is kind of trivial. <laughs> like the, if you, if like the the, it's part of the. Um, uh, how shall I say? I build within Visual Studio, so I don't. I, other than telling Visual Studio to build, I don't do that. I don't automate anything else. I also am not very good at this part, so I'm gonna. Uh, not spend too much time on the on the test automations uh, in this presentation, but I'll be focusing on those those other three branches, which should carry us largely through the through the time slot anyway. Um, so setup automation, uh, the most uh, when you first start with a uh, with a module, there are a bunch of uh, different projects that have been or are still alive with DNN module templates. Who uses a DNN module template when they create a project? So about half who who, who creates their modules just really just a VB, open it up and does not use the module template. All right. So large part for you guys. Um, so the, the, the Jedi master of uh, module templates is a it's Christopher Hammond. He's he's the one that uh, uh, that started this, uh, uh, or started this. I mean, he for for a long time he devoted a lot of energy uh, to having decent module templates out there, and you can easily find them. So I'm just gonna see if uh, right, and we're gonna we're gonna uh, check these out. Um, you have to keep in mind, of course, those templates are not. Cast in concrete, but let's have a look at uh, Chris's templates. So I go over here and fire up a browser. 
and I type in um, .NET nuke, uh, nuke module templates. If internet actually will work for me. Can you use the microphone, please? If, if the internet will work for me. <coughs> All right. I'll try to sit closer to the, uh, to the microphone. Right, so uh, I mean Chris's, Chris's templates immediately appear at the top if you, uh, if you try this and you get to the CodePlex project where he has those. There, there are a couple of others um, and you know, I didn't go and check out every single project that I could find on module templates. I just want to illustrate something um, with them. Um, we're going to burn through time with the speed of this internet connection. Um, Ah, there you go. But basically, a module template, right, it goes to your templates directory of Visual Studio. Um, let's have a look. Get Visual. You have templates, and templates are um, template, templates are, are basically a zip file, and in the zip file, you'll find a bunch of content, a bunch of files basically that obviously will be copied into your project with a manifest. So if you start a, uh, a project in Visual Studio and we'll uh, new project, of course that's where you find them, right? So you have the DNNVB compiled module project for instance. This is the uh, this is the template that uh, Chris created. And it will give you a whole bunch of files to get started with. Right? It, edit, few settings, view, ASCX stuff. Right. So far, so good. I mean, it, it does create a kind of a baseline for a module. The only thing is that once you've, uh, once you've used it a couple of times, um, I always get the urge to begin to tweak things a little bit. Say, oh, well actually how does this work? And we're going to cancel out of this and we're going to go to one of those templates or yeah, about this one. Uh, I'm just going to actually explode it here. And these files are, let's look at the edit ASCX for instance. Open it up. All right, that's just more or less the ASCX as you would find it, but you can you notice here and here are placeholders. And you know this this is not rocket science. I mean these things are just tokens that are obviously being replaced by some values as you're creating this template. Because if you if you open it up and you start the template, then all of a sudden that that stuff has been replaced by some meaningful text. Um, then you go to the manifest. You open that up and you find that you get these parameters. Let me open it up in because um, it gets, gets a bit uh, messy like this. Yeah, why not? It's an XML file anyway. That, get rid of that, get rid of this, and we're off. So, here we see those custom parameters being replaced. Now, of course, the, the confusing thing here is oh, geez, actually, that, you know, in the template that was hard coded to, uh, to Dotnet New Corporation, and obviously, like, these are values that you want to replace with your own. Uh, your own company name. Um, but I found the whole thing, uh, yeah, the one thing that struck me is it, it was, uh, not only did it not include a whole bunch of files that I was regularly using, um, but also the, the amount of parameters was rather limited in the, in the, um, in the whole template. Right, if I start a project, I'll do it again, 
a new project. Um, I just have this field here. And as far as I know, there's no mechanism for me in that manifest to say, show another field here for value X, Y, Z, and limit that to, I don't know, something else. And so it, um, even though it's a nice thing to have the templates, I, I, I still find it very, very limited in terms of, of, um, of setting up my project quickly. Uh, so then I wanted to uh, move on and say, well, you know, how about you just create your own installer? Because after all, what this does is not very difficult. It's just a, basically replacing a bunch of tokens in, uh, in, in files and, and just adhere to the, same, uh, to the same mechanism more or less. So for that, I'm going to uh, go here to my programs. Store. Right, so I get a few more options basically to to start creating this. I'm just going to quickly nix the. I'm first going to create a website that we can use for testing in this. Uh, another bit of time. Um, we're going to use. DNNC 2014. We're going to go for uh, for this release. Who's played with uh, the beta version 7.3.0? Who's downloaded 7.3.0 of uh, two, three, four people? Not that many. Basically, that does a whole bunch of stuff for me. Where are we? There we go. So we'll let that install. In the meantime, I'm going to just let this thing roll out. Who uses PowerShell, by the way, to create their own sites? Anyone? No. Nope. Yeah, I could spend another hour on that. <laughs> the PowerShell uh, stuff. Yeah, the whole lot. Just uh, unzipping the file. I know, you know, where I store all the release versions. I um, that script uh, creates the directory, unpacks the, the zip file, creates a database, updates the web.config uh, with a couple of changes uh, that I want, notably the connection string, of course, um, set an email out, uh, email capture folder. Uh, uh, basically, the, the, what, what web.config is actually um, crossed with an XSL uh, file to create the web.config that I want. Uh, for the site, and then it's completely configured for me already. Um, Making that very and, and and there were a couple of parameters in the script. So the version of DNN, name of the site. Okay, that's pretty obvious. And then there's actually a, a template like like what kind of an installation I want. Like default I used, which is just the the way it came out of the box. But I have another one uh, where there's just a directory, it merges whatever is in that directory, a couple of modules, uh, whatever I want into that, um, into that installation. And then I have it running. So I hit, hit the road running. Yes? The, which, the, from the, the PowerShell bit? Yeah. Uh, it's completely mine. I, I couldn't use the, uh, yeah, it, the thing, it, after all it gets very specific, but this is the way I develop and, and this is where, you know, I, how, I, how I do things and quite quickly when you unpack someone else's like uh, automation solution, 
you find out that you know they, they do things a little bit differently because their world is maybe a bit different in you know in how, how they do things. But you can find inspiring ideas there that you can grab and then mold into your own uh, into your own situation. I in the, I ended up writing you know, quite a few scriptlets myself to do a number of tasks that didn't come out of the box for uh, uh, for with PowerShell. Um, Going back to the template installer, so now the template installer will say, well, where, do, what do you want to do? I'm going to go for a module. I'm going to go for a, uh, um, a project that I need to do soon, and it's for a bus schedule that needs to be visible on our uh, website for my paragliding club called Albatross. And we're going to do that in this connect thing. Okay. And boom. Okay, so at that point in time, if I go to the directory where where we're actually at, on the desktop modules, it's created it's created the um, the subfolders for company name and then uh, your application name. So we're talking about best practices uh, earlier. I mentioned best practices earlier. One of my pet peeves is, for God's sake, you know, create for your modules, create subfolders, uh, you know, company name, uh, project name. Keep stuff out of the hair of, of other people. Um, we recently had a bit of a clash with, um, for instance, the news module. Like the core modules have been set up. Uh, always to start straight in the desktop modules folder. It was never prefixed with a with a subfolder for DNN or for DNN Corp. Um, and that's led already to some issues with clashes with other names uh, of other products. Um, so, you know, my advice is uh, company name, uh, product name, uh, folder structure. And now we get a bit of a different type of project. It's almost uh, what Chris had, but now I get a um, my I don't, I don't have the, the the ACXs in there yet because I'm actually generating them this that, those in another stage. Um, but most importantly, one of the thing one of my hobby horses is uh, is having a, a your own uh, a module based class. Um, does anyone? Uh, like who uses their own module base class in their in their modules? One, two, three, four. Nice. Um, the rest, yeah, get with the program. Like it's like you know that every every control inherits from portal module base, and portal module base is supplied by by the core framework and includes a whole bunch of stuff to access whatever is happening behind the scenes. It gives you the context basically of the control that you're working in. But this context is a generic DNN context. So when you're working in your own control, of course you're working in the context of your module. And one of the first things you want to do, of course, is create your own context for your settings. All right? So the um, I go to the uh, the properties here. So I have the context security here and module settings. Let me focus on the module settings for a sec. So the module settings are overriding the settings. In, uh, in in your ASCX. So what happens is now if I have if I go to my module settings, I have a property. Um, let's say I have a public property um, foo bar as integer, and we start it with minus one. And here in the constructor is where you know I read that value and. Uh, I can save that value, so that's all in the settings class. Now, when I create my my ASCX, when I go to my my UI, creating my UI, I have user control, yeah. and I wire that to inherit, of course, of my module base. Now, with my I get my foo bar right there, right, and I don't have to deal with a whole bunch of bunch of ugly code where, at all points in time, you're trying to find out is there actually a value for this, and if so, can you please coerce that into an integer? 
um, basically you're continuously working with hard typed uh, settings everywhere in your module and you just stuck it into your settings class overriding this, this hash table that there is before. Um, I still see modules that don't use uh, a pattern like this and um, if I can show you the example of uh, where do we go here? Uh, let me see the old blog module. I have it somewhere. You spot it? Blog three. Yeah, let me move from list. Hang on a second. Where was that? Jeez, those screens are small. Oh, yeah. right. There we go. This is a typical example of some old code. Like in this is in a in an ACX code behind. So he's trying to find blog ID, and basically the the, the code is just littered, like full, crammed full of these three line constructs of every time trying to find if there is, okay, actually this is the parameters, where you should get the, this is the blog settings, this is the one actually, here, right? So here he gets his, here he gets his settings and says, okay, well, by the way, I need to find out if in my settings I have page blogs set, if not, then, etc. And all of that stuff should have been handled in a base class uh, to start with. To, to abstract your 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 your, um, your UI code from that. So anyway, um, one of the uh, pet peeves. And now we have a new uh, mechanism that was rolled into the platform in seven point uh, seven point two or seven one two. A way to coerce those values uh, is now actually. Uh, in the platform. So let me just a shorthand method to actually read the value from uh, from a hash table. It makes life a lot easier and makes your code a lot easier. Otherwise you're writing continuously for every value, you're writing your three lines of code again. Like if there is a value for a foobar in my settings hash table that should become an integer. If there isn't, then leave the integer, leave foobar alone. Um, that is now all uh, a single line code, making it a lot more readable, of course, if you have multiple uh, properties and, and you just stack the, those lines one after the other. It's a lot easier to spot typos in your, in this for instance, or uh, if you've forgotten one value or not. Uh, it, it becomes a lot more uh, compact and easier to read your code by using this uh, get value uh, function, which is in common utilities, not new common utilities dictionary extensions. Right. These extend the dictionary uh, values. Anyway, let's get back to, uh, to what we're doing here. It needs to uh, wake up or not? Yeah. So my my suggestion to you is is go in and perfect that template. Go in and and look at your projects, the way you code, and just change that template. And if if you find that, um, like myself, if you find that just having the project name is not enough, 
it's trivial to create a little installer that has a couple of values that you know exactly, okay, that module is immediately, when it's created, like I've done already what, I, what used to cost me like two hours to you know, configure and set up and everything. I, I think that stuff is mundane and it can be done quite easily. So, um, that we did. Um, that we did. Uh, create your own installer, etc. And that we did. And that we did. Uh, using folders to correspond to namespaces. Um, everyone understands what I what I mean by that. We all do that nowadays. We've seen how .NET Nuke organizes code and uses folders for namespaces. We uh, resharper was mentioned earlier. I mean, it's one of the things that you can win, like a, a license to resharper with our uh, Git presentation. Um, Reshuffer actually enforces this by default, so it uh, makes life a bit easier. Right now, the the, um, the second part. So coding automation. Um, coding automation is uh, um, something that that's more of a uh, how should I say hot um, hot topic. Um, for me and. Uh, I, I think for many of my colleagues, we, we still structure our, our programming environment, our, our, our world, our mental model of what we're doing um, in those three tiers, presentation layer, business layer, and, and data layer. And, you know, the presentation layer is where everything is pretty and it's very nicely done and it's like, wow, this is, you know, the best application in the world. Then you've got your business layer, this is where you do your your magic. I mean, this is where you're, uh, you know, you've done your brilliant work, and uh, the data layer. Well, you know, that's not the most interesting part of the whole application. It's basically going through the mechanics of stuff. And when we when we look at it, so when we look at it, like the presentation layer and business layer, it's mostly in the front of our head. And this automation layer, of the data layer, is like we have it in the back of our mind, but. Um, so when um, and when we look at the, the data layer, there's a couple of strategies. I mean, the, the um, uh, you've probably heard of the terms like the DAL one, DAL two, DAL two plus, and now the latest uh, data layer uh, approach of DNN. Um, there, there have been like it, it it hasn't changed all that much over the years, but recently they have made a big change in DNN itself, which is to use a um, an auto what is it called? A, it's a mapper. Uh, yeah, uh, Petapoco um, entity framework was there be before this, uh, which was popular for a while. But entity framework, uh, I think, could not work with the object qualifier or something like that. And anyway, at one point it was chosen to go with Petapoco, so that takes care of uh, talking to your database uh, in, a, in a more or less automated uh, fashion. Um, I still come from. Uh, from the time where we did all of that by hand, where we coded uh, a method in uh, the data provider class and then created the correct SQL to correspond to that. Um, I, uh, you know, the, the, of course there are pros and cons for each approach. Uh, the advantages for me anyway for code generation of that, that bottom layer is I get more control over the final code. I actually see the SQL. I, I, you know, I have full control of the SQL. I can make a tweak if I need to. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, the, that, that could be just a feeling, you know, in terms of performance, but you yeah, always have the feeling that if you code this thing as close to the metal as possible, that it will be the most performant. And instead of going somewhere and then, oh, there's this thing that does magic, and then you know it's in my database. And then whenever there's a problem, you always left with this question: like, did the magic bit in the middle screw me or not? Like, you, you know, that's uh, that's the better understanding and and well, debugging. Yeah, but, uh, you know, problem is well close to the metal. Yeah. Because that's really a little magic, or even yeah. like, yeah. if you have very, uh, you work with SQL, you must understand SQL. Okay. Probably with the entity framework, which. Uh, which does not. Control, yeah. And you have to deal with uh, data context. Does it 
Why? So it's a, yeah. So so for those that didn't hear, but Stefan uh, just completed that a little bit. Like the there is a big difference between how Petapoco does this and how Entity Framework do, uh, does this. So with Petapoco, you're much closer to the metal than uh, than with Entity Framework, and I guess that's also a reason why why Dean and Corp chose to go with uh, Petapoco. Uh, for this, but anyway, I'm, I'm not an expert on the on the on the Petapoco thing. However, I have become more or less an expert for myself anyway in the code generation for the DAL, um, because back in the day, uh, you know, we talked 2003, 2004, uh, there was a very popular uh, product called CodeSmith. It still exists. Um, there have been a couple of other similar uh, uh, projects, my generation and, uh, and T4 I mentioned here specifically. What they do is uh, they allow you to create templates to create code. And uh, usually the power of the whole application comes from the fact that you can actually point the application to a database and then begin to, in your templates, to use that database connection to create code. So the, that makes, yes, Sebastian. I, I think it's, it's a bit big advantage to have this code generation, but uh, what I have noticed is that whenever you make changes to the uh, database and you, you get to modify those templates manually, uh, this, those generated files manually, so then it becomes, in the long term, it becomes quite a uh, lot of effort compared to Pedagogo, where you have yeah. uh, just the uh, input class and with the annotations, and then you have your, your database. So you Right. Yes. Yes. No, I, 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 I don't exclude that there are. Um, uh, that's obviously one of the downsides of, of code generation is you are responsible for a piece of maintenance of that yourself. Absolutely. Um, but one of the things you can do is create partial classes to keep, for instance, automated code out of the hair of your 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 little tweaks. Um, I, I don't know if you guys use that a lot. I, I use it all the time. Uh, just different files, partial class, and keep stuff a little bit separate uh, from each other. Um, and having a great diff tool is obviously something that is indispensable as well as you're working through this. So with CodeSmith. Uh, it's the one that I, I've, I've used the most. Uh, so that's basically just like an ASCX. You 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 intermingle uh, code with um, well with with other code. Basically, your your static code with the dynamic code, and it just runs through it and uh, and and creates that. Um, now we're going to go over to CodeSmith. Just give a little. Uh, demo of that. We, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Save that. Why not? Let's close that off. to um, uh, let's make that ASCX or ASP for instance it becomes a bit easier to make already right um, yeah uh, you, you kind of Get the, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's like who's used CodeSmith before here? Who's seen this kind of stuff? Right. Um, who, who's completely new to, to templated code generation? Like who's never done any code generation with any templates? So all of you have done something with it. Okay. Um, anyway, so this is, uh, it, it's a lot like ASP uh, for generating code. And it gives me uh, uh, the possibility to uh, to generate stuff. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, th th I mean, there was uh, uh, back in the the early 2000s, uh, CodeSmith had uh, DNN templates for module development on their site, 
And recently I did a, for this presentation, did a research again, and indeed some of them have been updated. So there is like the, the most recent version was 5.4 of, of DNN that someone sent in uh, templates for, for Codesmith. But on the whole, it is not a, yeah, it's not a very lively thing. Um, uh, but I think there's still some, some, uh, some useful stuff there. One of the things that is quite interesting is that uh, the templates, again, they inherit by default from their Codesmith template class, um, but there is nothing against you creating your own template class that inherits from that. So we're going to do the same trick as we did before. Um, and let me see. Let's, let's just go here. I'm just going to keep that open actually. template and actually it allowed me to um, go automate the loading of other templates and regenerating uh, code so what I'm you know the, again at that point once you're in in .NET of course you can use the whole wealth of .NET to create some methods that you can then leverage in your template to generate more code so if you feel that there are some shortcomings with the templates and, and it's very hard to solve with just basic templated code. Um, create your own create your own class, create your own .NET solution for this and you can generate stuff that is so complex. So for me, um, yeah, here for instance one thing is uh, um, getting from uh, or converting for instance from DB types to VB types, I didn't find that, or, or, or to C-sharp types, I didn't find it very perfect, so I, I could make tweaks to that, uh, to that code. Um, actually, you know, just going in and reading uh, other database uh, types than, uh, than SQL. Um, it, and, and it made my, 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 comp uh, my, my templates somewhat more condensed. So I'm just going to go into the, um, to the database and create an object here. Uh, let me just have a look. For our schedule um, application, right? So, I'm going to go over here and to that database. Great. Will that execute. Okay, so that created. No, that's fine. Tables and I don't need that. There we go. So basically, I just created a, a table. Ah, there we go. Yeah, a table with some of the properties that are important for my application, and um, uh, just added that to the database. And of course, I have prefixed that with uh, an app name so that it will stay out of the hair of other uh, tables. I, I presume you guys will do this as well when you're writing the application to just prefix your, your tables in, uh, in, in the database. So. Can you suggest to company prefix, um, maybe yeah. only but the company prefix, project prefix. Right. Might be very small ones. Uh, maybe you combine it into one word, but, but uh, having something like this makes sure that it doesn't break with another module. If you call it t a timer or schedule, then it's a big risk that anyone else has the idea to call it the same way. Nothing is more irritating than to, uh, to have someone 
uh, you know, report in like, hey, you know, this is this error, and to find out that actually you, behind the scenes your module is clashing with someone else's component like you never heard of. Um, so yeah, there's some some basic tips to um, to just stay out of the hair uh, of the others. The DNN doesn't have a mechanism to detect this and to prevent it. No. You will notice on a from file install user will, uh, from module install user will notice that uh, that there's an error from the database maybe. Uh, it how, depends how it's written, uh, but uh, it will not he will not know what works, what has been done, and if he tries to uninstall afterwards, it might even uh, clash uh, and, and, and you need a table from another module. Yeah. That's really a big problem for the uh, users. Exactly. Uh, 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 work for, not only for tables but also for your sort of procedures and other of database objects. Yeah. Just a sec. Yeah. Guess what? I do have a. I'm just going to give that one more try to see if we. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, that's what I needed to change. The rest is more or less correct. And so this is a settings file actually for me for my um, uh, that was read by that base class of um, of what I wanted to do. Uh, So what does that create? Um, a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> so now all of a sudden I have um, kind of the skeleton of, um, of various things. Uh, I copy this over. Do components. Boom. I fire up my uh, thing again. Okay, I'm gonna kind of this. I'm going to go to that um, solution we had. Entities. So we we get our our you know our properties read from the um, from the database. Uh, we get our first. Uh, controller with you know you get a first CRUD statements uh, coming in. I have to do the uh, yeah we haven't imported the data classes yet, but uh, this part so this is the business layer and the data layer as well. So of course. Right? You kind of get the picture. It's basically generated all of this. Now, there's there's ways to to um, to keep doing this in a, in a that will cause you know that that will mitigate the problem that you have, right? Of of, of having to maintain code uh, that is there instead of using an automated fashion. Um, again, you know, there's there's trade-offs for. Um, for, for both methodologies, I wanted to show you this because this is what I use. Uh, I don't think you 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 have to do it this way, but uh, uh, it's a suggestion to to do it that way. And for sure, I mean, the one thing I would like uh, I would like you to to understand or take home from this is um, just because the template, the CodeSmith template that you download or, or whatever templating solution that you use. Um, <coughs> 
just because it doesn't really do what you want it to do. I mean, there's, there's often mechanisms to completely change the behavior of it. And actually, you know, on a good rainy Sunday, you can make stuff that really uh, gets you a lot further uh, doing this. So there you have that. And then, uh, let me see. So let's go back here. What are we doing in terms of time? We are approaching the end, right? So, yeah, I really have to round off. Okay, so I'm going to go very quickly to right, test automation. So that's not really my domain of expertise, uh, but it's the domain of uh, right test-driven development, unit testing, etc. There's always been a, a challenge in the fact that we're, we, you know, a module is just embedded in a website, and that kind of stuff lends it with web forms very difficult to um, uh, to test automation. There have been valiant efforts uh, using Watin and Selenium uh, to do this, um, but that stuff has been abandoned, and uh, everyone's you know moving over to to MVC. So, uh, and the test-driven development, uh, you know, the guy that I See most is uh, Phil Beadle uh, from Australia. Now, packaging automation. Now, obviously, that's something we all do, right? Uh, the uh, there's two two ways about it, as far as I know. So there's MS Build and there's NAND. The uh, MS Build Jedi Master is sitting in front of me. Uh, <laughs> you created that stuff and maintain that stuff, so that's. Uh, any questions about MS Build, the expert is here. Um, I'm more of a NAND uh, person, I got caught in, in, in that. Um, for me, the, the, the things that I find the most important uh, for my packaging automation to do is uh, processing certain files, so JavaScript, minimizing JavaScript files, minimizing CSS files, for instance. Um, making sure that all the bits and pieces are actually in that distribution file, in, in, in the zip file. I mean, the uh, uh, leave out the junk and make sure that the, the right bits go in there. Um, set the DLL versions. Who who creates, uh, who sets versions on their, on their DLL when they build? Who doesn't? Uh, okay. Uh, um, one of my pet peeves, please, if you label your DLL, uh, it makes life a lot easier when you're uh, in a situation, you're trying to debug a situation. In Windows, you can just right-click a file and say, what version is that? If that corresponds to the module version, you kind of know that the DLL was copied in, and it's, it's that version that you're working with. Um, set the references correctly. Uh, as you all know, in .NET, you reference other libraries, notably .NET Nuke. Uh, you reference the wrong .NET Nuke version, and you've got a whole bunch of people complaining uh, that they can't install the module because it will blow up uh, .NET. Um, and of course, create your manifest and make sure that the manifest is absolutely dead on on what is being copied in. So I, uh, uh, with NAND, I, what I do is I, I check all the project references and wire them to a references folder where I keep the DLLs that I reference. So .NET Nuke sits in this particular folder, and I know that that is the version I'm compiling against, and that is the version that will be mentioned in the manifest as the as the minimum version of DNN to be used. Uh, again, it's very easy in Visual Studio with a single click and not notice that your references have shifted to the bin folder and it's using the version that you're actually developing on as the, the, the version to, uh, to reference against. And that could be a different version, so. Um, well, what you, could, what you could do is you could develop on the latest version but compile against an older version, which gives you a, a fairly decent breadth of versions that you're going to be able to support, because any issue in a recent version you will immediately see as, you, as, you, as you're running your module. That, that's why I, you know, I, I feel about taking that, that bandwidth. Um, 
Right, that's, that's basically what it, um, uh, what it does. So uh, the way that looks is, uh, in, in my case, you've got your NAND script files. Um, NAND script, of course, the um, uh, MS build was based off NAND, uh, in, in a sense. I mean, it, it, it took off where, where, where NAND left it. And um, let's have a look. Dunk my programs NAND, and these are my, you know, my NAND files. Building, it's hard to to you know can can work through, through all the, the different uh, different aspects of it, but uh, basically it it sets. So there's a task here for uh, for setting versions of it. It goes through it. It makes sure that with the um, uh, where are we? Sorry, 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 sorry. At the top there, um, it goes to the versions directory, the references directory, and makes sure that the references directory in the in the uh, project file that the references are actually correctly uh, wired to that references folder. So it will find the DLL and set the references correctly in the project folder if that wasn't already done. Um, Making sure that when it compiles, which is the next stage, that the compilation process will actually reference those files that you've put in that references folder. You're absolutely dead sure now that if you put DNN 6.0.0 in that folder, that is the version that will be compiled against. And then uh, creating the assemblies, then what I do is actually do a reverse engineering thing on it where I actually read the version again from the DLL to make absolutely sure that all the versions have been set correctly and that will be the version that's used in the manifest uh, of, the, um, uh, of your packaging. That, um, and, the, and, and of course the great thing is like with MS Build, uh, you can create your own tasks right? You, in .NET. Um, who has okay? So who, first of all, who's using MS Build packaging mechanisms? Right? Are there any old school NAND? Uh, no, probably I'm the only one. But anyway, this 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 applies to both. Um, having a task to set the the the, the project version itself. Um, it, it's uh, it's it. You know, it allows you to uh, to do your magic with .NET, which becomes a little bit easier than uh, uh, than doing stuff necessarily in the uh, in MS Build or in NAND uh, in, in its own vocabulary. So, who's created MS Build tasks themselves? Okay, that's decidedly less. Okay, so I you know I advise you to look at that. It, it's it's really great technology, and once you're you're off doing that. All of a sudden, you realize that a lot of the little things that you know your specific source, what you're doing in your projects, you can actually automate that in the inside of the build process. So, and uh, there we go, build support, and I should probably not try to fire up this thing, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, we have to set some things correctly. Um, I'm just going to go to my other one. I have the same similar installation here. Um, so again, So you get a, a zip file that has its DLL, and if if there were, of course, uh, SQL files, they would they would be sitting there as well, and your resources file, all packaged together, and your uh, your 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 manifest labeled correctly, which version it's compiling against, and 
what assemblies and what versions they have. So, um, you know, we don't have time to go any deeper into it than that. Uh, I'm just going to go back to the presentation. Let me just. There was uh, two packages, source package and package. Yes. I, so the source package basically just packages also the, the, the code behind packages into that resources file. I, 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 that, that's the way I distribute, for instance, in the open source projects, the, uh, the source code. So you would, if, if you're interested in the blog module and you want to get the source code, the quickest way is to install the source package and you have the whole project set up on the desktop modules. The? I'm not sure I understood. Uh, ah, yeah, you can you, obviously you can use Git to pull in a project, um, but then of course you get you, know, you get the whole the whole history and everything right from the from the project. That that's another way to do it for sure. But the um, uh, the quickest way to do it is install the source package because it will also install the module itself, right? So you, if you have a site and you say install, install blog version XYZ source, it will create the blog module for you just like it was a regular module and the source files will be there. But without Git, without a Git source control. That's for sure. So uh, without further ado, some last things. Okay, please generate the manifest at the end of the whole process to make absolutely sure that it reflects what the files is. Um, use the resource files for a resource file to, to, to bundle everything else, otherwise you get huge manifests. And uh, label your DLLs with the version number, I talked about that. And that covers for me uh, that part of automation. So. Um, now comes the time for questions. <laughs> Any question? Have you used uh, import for generating? No. no. I've, uh, I've listened to a presentation by, um, uh, I think by Scott Hauselman or something about it and briefly looked at it, but uh, no, I never, never went in depth. Yeah. Yeah. The question was if, if uh, 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 actually it's a good question for the audience, has anyone used T4 generations for, a, yeah? Okay. What, 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 was your, what was your feeling? Okay. Yeah, okay. I guess one of the reasons why Codesmith became so popular was that it was so close to the old ASP stuff that a lot of people would naturally just understand how to write a template. Um, yeah. More questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, If you have any questions, uh, feel free to, uh, to ask me, uh, tap me on my shoulder.